Good morning. Welcome, so is this everyone. Beauty and the Beast this morning, Elizabeth. I'm coming straight from Oktoberfest, actually. <laughs> this is leftover from 2019, back when gatherings were happening in Germany. So I think uh, my outfit, I think, would be acceptable because I am wearing a mask. Yes. Yes, exactly. And we are joined by a mystery guest as well. Uh, you want to say a few words, dude? I don't know. That's just your opinion, man. <laughs> well, we're in for a bit of a treat this morning, everybody. We're kind of uh, kicking off the Halloween season. What's the date anyway? How many days to Halloween? Oh, I think four days. Yeah. But uh, we thought we'd inject a little bit of fun into, you know, Excel and Revit could be seen as a bit stodgy, but... Um, while we take our work seriously, we thought we'd have a little fun with things, and uh, I think we're we're on our way. Yes. What do you think, Dr. Jones? Yeah, yeah, definitely. We're gonna have some fun this morning. Yeah. Did you actually see out of that thing, Dale? That's that that is a bit of an issue. <laughs> <laughs> the dude can't see very well either. He has some <laughs> fogging issues, so this makes for some interesting demos. Yeah, this is this is a you know kind of advanced webinar when especially live demo if you can't actually see what you're doing it it takes it to a new level. I know um, some on the call may know of John Calkins, the uh, main Esri producer behind the scenes, and in 2007 I heard him give a talk on how to prepare for a demo, and he says you should have practiced so much that you don't even have to think about where your mouse is going, you just know how to do it, and so that's I'm sure the dude has done that. <laughs> The dude is slightly a little, a uh, little bit more relaxed than that sort of approach. I think is uh, <laughs> probably the case. The, the dude likes to kind of go with the moment a little bit more. Yeah, the dude knows where he's going to end up. Doesn't know how he's going to get there. All right. We are going to take guesses at the end as to who's behind the the mask. So we'll uh, we'll see, and I'm sure that I can dig out a prize for whoever a good guess. But family members won't be eligible, dude. <laughs> the dude doesn't really know if his family members know what knows what the dude does, so I doubt they're here. <laughs> That's a clue, everybody. All right. Well, Elizabeth, is it time to shut off the cameras and get get a bit more serious? Yes, sounds good. It is that time. Let me see if I can figure it out without being able to see. There we go. Well, thanks everyone for joining us this morning on our inaugural issue, inaugural episode of the Masked Revit user. And the idea from this for this webinar came a while ago when the dude who is joining us approached us with the concept of just getting together and showing some interesting workflows with BIM data, specifically Revit. And so we uh, experimented with a few different formats or thought about it, thought experimented, and ended up with what we landed on today. And I think you're in for a bit of a treat because besides being just hopefully a little bit fun, you're going to learn some very interesting ways of leveraging Revit and FME to get the most out of your BIM data. So our presenters today are myself, I am Dale Lutz, I'm one of the co-founders of Safe Software, and I'll call out the various characters and get them to introduce themselves. So next up, we've got Dave Campanis. Dave. Hi, I'm Dave Campanis, I'm with the, what am I with these days? Oh yes, uh, Strategic Technical Support Specialist. Uh, basically, I help people do cool things with uh, FME. Great, and uh, Dimitri, glad to welcome you here today, and uh, you wanna introduce yourself? Ooh. I think I think we'll have to go back, and Dimitri's going to have to um, maybe call in later uh, to get his audio sorted out. Sorry, folks, but Dimitri is uh, also a scenario creation expert at SAFE and has been with us for many, many years, pushing FME into new frontiers, and lots of those have been involving Revit data and BIM data and augmented reality, and he's our closer today, so you're going to want to hang on to the end to see and hear his presentation, but I'm hoping he gets his sound sorted out by then. And lastly, we have our masked Revit user, The Dude. The Dude, would you like to say something about yourself without revealing who you are? Uh, yeah, so you can call me The Dude or El Dudorino if you believe in that whole brevity thing. Um, also, I know a little bit about Revit and a tiny bit about FME, and I'm glad to be here today. 
And uh, just want to thank the dude for suggesting this and being a good sport as we put this together and, and have some fun. And I think we're all going to get a chance to learn quite a bit. So, so hang on. Here we go. So just um, to set the stage for those that don't know what Revit is, it's a BIM modeling software from Autodesk. It's been around forever. One of the industry leaders, if not the industry leader in this area that these kind of folks, you can see the architects and engineers and so on, use to create 3D models, rich, rich 3D models of buildings as they are meant to be created. Um, dude, would you add any more to this definition or for what, what does Revit mean to you, dude? Well, the dude usually uses it for making drawings and those sort of things, but also coordinating work. But there's a lot of interesting and rich data in there. So we would always look to find a way to extract it to make it available to people to help them use that on top of the model and drawing production part. Excellent. And that's really what we're going to be looking at today. So so we're going to have uh, a deeper look into that. So those of you that are Revit users, whether you're masked or not, if you want to just type into the um, question panel, um, tell us, tell us what you would wish if you could have anything you wanted out of your Revit data, what would it be? What would you like to do more with your Revit data if you had the chance? And, um, and now I've opened up the question panel for the first time and I see Stan has said that we've gone crazy today, which that's um, kind, of, <laughs> kind, of, kind of funny. But anyway, does anybody have some of the things that they would like to uh, see? Fire them into the question panel, what you'd like to get out of your Revit data. Would it be, um, you know, a CSV file? Would it be, I guess IFC you can kind of do within Revit. Um, let's see. Here's a good one. Summarize architectural features contained in a Revit file. Total square feet by type per floor, wall surfaces, ceiling surfaces, total number of windows by type, lighting fixtures by type, plumbing fixtures. Yes, I've made the joke before that it's not a Revit file unless there's a urinal in it. But can these summaries be provided by room and floor? And so. Um, my gut is yes. I don't. I mean, I have to probably defer to people like Dave when um, when he gets there, uh, gets online here. We'll, we'll come back to this at the end. But lots of this to me seems pretty straightforward. Model into GIS, 2D floor plans, and 3D. Pretty much think we can do that, and we'll show some things. Um, oh, to CAD using a client's standard. That's a, a great one. And um, the answer would be yes. Uh, that that can be done. There's some work involved, but definitely. Uh, much, much easier with um, with the approaches we're going to show today than other ones. But thanks very much for some of those. Oh, they still keep coming in. We'll look more of these at the end. Oh, building shells. Yes, I know. I think, Dave, don't you call those jelly cubes sometimes? Uh, jelly cubes are more of an organization, organizational like uh, uh, floor plan layout in 3D. But uh, no, keep those, keep those suggestions coming in because uh, this is how we do our we next webinar. Here yes. We Batch imported to cesium, and I can tell you that as we speak this morning, there are safers working away at improving our cesium writing. So there's a big sprint there. If you're a cesium user, let us know, um, and we can do that. Oh, getting into Tririga. Dave's a big Tririga fan. So uh, yeah, anyway, keep on typing them in as you um, watch the show, and we'll answer and uh, talk about these either later today or, as Dave says, in a future webinar. So what are we actually going to be talking today? Well, we've looked a little bit uh, at Revit. We're going to introduce you to what FME is in case some of you have joined us for the first time. And we do really appreciate that if, if you are and what we kind of are about. Then we're going to look at uh, some interesting Revit scenarios. So going to Excel, uh, the number two output format in FME is Excel. Uh, why not? And so um, we're going to look at that, looking at detecting changes. Um, creating some web maps, IMDF, which is indoor mapping, and some of you had asked for this type of, of scenario. And lastly, um, Dimitri is going to show us a little bit of AR, and here's hoping his sound will work when we get to that. But the, the motivation here for all of this, and this is what people like the dude had been telling SAFE for years, that the richness that's in the, that wonderful data inside of Revit is often just not leveraged enough. And it's it's just under too tight of a of a vault and you, and it needs to get out of there to be set free to really be leveraged and used in in a variety of different ways and we really want to make folks aware that you can get your data out of there and do all kinds of interesting things with not that much work 
using Revit and FME together. And that's kind of our, our goal to date. So you can think of this, that Revit is an outrageously powerful tool and FME, the, what we're gonna be showing today is a nice sidekick to have uh, in your toolbox if you need to be working with this data and we're wanting to leverage it further. Yeah, you can make your Revit data work for you, frankly, like never before. And some of these scenarios that uh, we're, we're rolling by, I think you're gonna see are, are absolutely achievable without a lot of hard work. So at Safe Software, our overall mission as a company is to help all of you maximize the value of your data. And really, it's like this mission, this mission statement was around before we started doing BIM stuff, but it really comes to the comes to the fore when it's BIM data that we're talking about because there's so much data in there that is often not maximized in terms of its value. And that's really what we're hoping to help. We've been around for a long time and people around the world have been using us for a wide range of things, but they all involve moving data from somewhere that it is to somewhere they'd like it to be, maybe doing some rearranging and transformation along the way. Our products manifest themselves in a couple of ways. On the desktop, we have this thing called FME Workbench, where you design the data flow from, the, from wherever the data is, in our case today, probably Revit, and you run it through these blue things and end up sending the data to its destination. <laughs> That Gorn suit makes you sneezy, sorry. Um, anyway, you get it to the destination and you, you set this up on your desktop, you test your workflows, <clears throat> you refine them. You might just run them once if you're done and uh, never use them again or bring them back next year. But if you wanna use them repeat repeatedly, then you go over to FME server where these workflows you authored on the desktop can be run in response to some kind of a stimulus, whether it's a file arriving in a directory, um, it's three o'clock in the morning, it's five o'clock somewhere. Any of those things will cause FME server to wake up and start doing things and producing outputs while you're sleeping. Uh, also, you can use it actually interactively from the web. And I think our friend, uh, Dr. Jones, is gonna show us that today as well. And lastly, FME Cloud is out there and it is a hosted FME server that you pay by the hour. And all of these can produce output that you can use on mobile, in particular, our FME AR application, which uh, Dimitri will show today. And what we find, the, the interesting part is that we're really focusing on geolocating those models so you can actually reason about the real world. And it's got some interesting implications for BIM data. The desktop is, as I said, where you author these workflows and you can document what's going on. So if you come back a year later, you can figure it out and you do this graphically and off you go and you'll see our friends using this right away. Uh, in terms of the breadth of data support, you can see that we started off doing JS and CAD. At some point, a little bit ahead of our time, we started to flirt with BIM stuff, adding 3D and IFC into FME in the late 2000s and refining that. So I think about a year ago, we got, well, no, maybe more like two years ago, we got Revit in there as a, as a native full-class citizen uh, as well. And you can see indoor mapping is has been added and AR and VR uh, some of our more recent things that we've brought into the FME hub. Today, there's about 450 or 500 uh, input and output formats or systems and about 500-ish transformations you can piece together like Lego to create the workflows you want. And I think with that, I am going to hand it over to the dude. Dude, do you abide? Does the dude abide? The dude needs to unmute, but the dude abides definitely. Excellent. Take it away, dude. Can everybody see my screen? We can see your desktop screen. It looks like it's gray at the moment. There we go. Yeah. Perfect. Like Dale said, I'm going to do just a couple of quick demos. Uh, you have to apologize. Dude's hair is pretty long today. So the first one I'm going to do is uh, a quick Revit to Excel demo. So what I'm going to do is basically just use the reader. There's a couple of ways to do this, but I'm going to use the simple one. So I'm going to pick a reader. I'm going to specify that I want the Revit format, and it's pre-baked, so I I know where to go here. And I could just pick a Revit file. And we've built some demos that will be shared to make this easy to, for you to reproduce. I can go into the parameters here, take a look to see what I'm getting. I'm not going to make any changes, but if you look in the list, you can get uh, sort of all elements or the shell. You can determine how you get the geometry out. Um, but I'm just going to hit OK 
And then the one last thing I want to choose is whether I want whether I want individual features or everything as one bundle. To make this really easy on myself, I'm going to just do uh, Revit Rooms to Excel. So I'm going to get the individual features, and you'll see what that means. It'll read through the Revit file. I'll go through here, and I'll just grab everything. And now what it's given me is a sort of a reader for each one of the features. And it, it depends on the format, how these things come out. But in uh, Revit parlance, it's giving me categories. So just to keep this organized, I'm going to put a bookmark around that so I can sort of keep track of that and move them around all at once. And then I just need a writer. So I'm just going to give myself an Excel writer and pick a destination, give it a name. And then I'll add that to the canvas. What you'll notice here is I have this copy from Reader. And this is by far the simplest way to say, uh, take the properties that come from the, the object being read and make sure I get them on the right so I don't have to do any work. And I just want rooms. So now I have the writer. I can go in here, grab my room info. And basically, at this point, I can hit run. It's going to prompt me to ask, you know, if it wants to read that file and write that file. And once it's finished, it's completed. You saw the log down here. I can click on the, the folder and it'll open that up for me. And what you'll see, if I do a little Excel magic, I can go into Format, Auto Fit With, and I've read all the room data. You can see, like, that's the category room. There's the identity data for the room name, number, and a host of other things. I think you guys are keep working on adding uh, capabilities over time, but this is uh, the default you're going to get that, that's coming out right now based on what I have in the Revit model. OK, let's keep moving. So I'm going to make one more, and we'll introduce, make a new workspace, and I'll introduce the change detector. And so for this one, I need two, two files. So I'm going to go back up here. And I'm going to go to grab my first, my old model. And I drag that on here. And I get the same options. I won't show those again, but this, this Revit model is labeled, labeled old. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to do individual uh, features. And I'm certainly going to make myself a bookmark. I'm going to select all again. So and then just label this thing to say old. And then I'm going to do the same thing. But I'm going to grab the new one. And same options. And bookmark again. New. And the, the other way you can do this would be to bring them in as individual or excuse me, a single merge feature and like use the annotation just to help yourself out. It would extract the, the file name and stuff like that. But with that, what I'll actually do is prepping and illustrating the basics. Um, I'm going to use the change detector. And change detector just allows you to do exactly what it says. And I'm going to use rooms again to demo this. So that's my new that goes into the revised. And I'm going to grab rooms from the old data. I'll move this around just a little bit so you can see that a little better. Maybe zoom in, zoom in there. And the first, the the key thing I need to do it uh, do is give the change detector a few properties so it know what's knows what to look for as the key attribute here. So if I click on this guy, and I go uh, and put select unique ID, that's going to be the parameter it uses to identify the objects across the two data sets. And then I can use check attributes, or I could just check geometry. I'm actually just going to check, uncheck the attributes. So I'll just show you a simpler data set. Um, so at this point, I could hit the run from here, or I could hit the run button. I'll just do the run button so it runs the whole workspace. It'll take a little bit longer, but not much time, because it'll read both Revit models. And there we go. And so what, what I'm able to see down here, if I switch to the 3D view, is you could maybe make out that there's actually some spaces there. Maybe if I turn that to black, you can see them. If I click on each one of these, I'm seeing individual rooms, so you can see those. What I'll do is just quickly add a uh, 
geometry color setter. And I'll do the basic color scheme of saying, I want a fixed color. And so that's uh, updated. Let's call that green. And let's make that a 0.7 for an alpha. So that's transparency. I'm just going to do a control D, duplicate. Uh, that's inserted. Let's call that, make that a blue. And then one more. And the dude makes messy workspaces, um, but the dude doesn't work in FME all the time. Uh, but I'll go in here and say that I want the background, the things that are unchanged, sort of a light gray, and I'm going to make them 0.5, so they're a little bit less clear. Now I'll rerun that. And so there's my options. And if I click on one of them, move this up here so you can see that you can see the 3d spaces there but if i click on all three of them you can see them together so that's the basics for me uh just walking through reading two revit files using a change detector setting the color pretty straightforward uh, and then the simpler workspace from excel i think dave will take it over from here and show you how to use these outside of the desktop like i'm using them and how to use them in the server uh, sure thing, dude. Thanks very much. Okay, let's show my screen. And we're showing the correct screen. Okay. So the change detection that dude showed is very useful, but it would be better if you could like share it amongst your firm and simplify it so your users don't need to go into FME mm -hmm. and, and do the, all that work. So I'm going to show you the same change detection uh, process, but as a web app. So we have a we have a web page we navigate to here. We can just drag and drop our old file onto the bottom section. We can drag and drop our new file into the top section. And then we pick which feature types we want to compare. Now the do compared rooms, but I think I'm going to go with doors and walls just for something different. And we click OK. Uh, this will take a few seconds. And we should uh, see what pops up. There we go. So here it's similar to what you saw in the data inspector. Uh, in this case, um, um, green is um, additions and blue is updates. And again, the walls, uh, the original walls are just gray. But this is panable, zoomable, you can look around. And it's all running in your web browser, which is kind of nifty. So the user. Uh, uh, at your company, all he sees is a web page and uh, the model popping up in a browser. He doesn't even know FME exists, which is kind of cool for him. It's it's really simple and easy to use. So how did we get from the workspace to uh, this stage? Well, let's go look at the workspace. So this is uh, the workspace similar to uh, the dude's workspace. There is a few changes I made in here. The major change here is to create an output that can be read in a web browser. So in this case, we're using uh, the 3JS scene creator. This creates the model in 3JS and allows us to, and puts it into a web page for viewing. It's a hub transformer, so it's, it's, uh, it, it doesn't come with FME, but if you just type 3JS on your desktop, uh, I have a custom transformer, it's already loaded, but it should have show up for the rest of you as an FME hub transformer. It's uh, really cool to use. The one key thing is you have to have a camera and light as well as the geometry for it to work. That took me a little while to grow. But um, I just grab a, a, a feature, grab the, take the bounds of the feature and, and set that up as a camera. So we've got the output. Um, we're, we're taking this HTML output. I'm just writing it to a simple text file writer. This is pretty much the easiest writer in FME. And it can, it's, it's handy if you're working with any sort of ASCII data because um, you can do whatever you want. The, the writer does no formatting to the data whatsoever. It just takes what it, whatever's in the attribute and dumps it out. So we've got the HTML, we've dumped it out to the writer. And then I added another little section just to, to allow you to choose the uh, feature type because we don't want them all showing up on screen at the same time. It makes it hard to see what's going on. So now that we have the workspace set up, how do we get it up to the web app? Well, we're gonna use uh, FME server. 
And so the first thing we're going to do is we are going to publish your file, publish the FME server. Now, as Dale mentioned, FME server is a companion application to FME desktop that allows us to automate and, and, and serve up workspaces in a, in a, in a web uh, form amongst other things. So we're gonna to connect to the server. Now we come up with a dialogue and it says repository name and workspace name. Workspace name, we'll just take from workspace, that's cool. Repository name, there's a few repositories. Uh, there's some that come standard with uh, FME server or you can create new ones. And repositories are just a, a, a good way of organizing your workspaces. So you keep, keep the workspaces that you're publishing, uh, say for certain jobs or certain uh, categories, all uh, organized together. Um, you notice why I've already uploaded a few, but we're gonna overwrite this one. Um, there's also the option to upload data files. Sometimes you wanna uh, uh, share, like a, have a file that you're reading go with the workspace, say a support file, like a, say you have a, a category mapping or something that's in a CSV or an Excel file, you want to go with the workspace, you can upload that as well and it will use it so that the user doesn't need to upload that every time. So let's hit next, publish, yeah, I already know I've got it there already. So now we have our services. Now, in this case, I've chosen the data streaming service because I want the HTML I create streamed back to the web page seamlessly. So I don't want them to have to download a file and then open up again. I just want it to pop up on screen. And the data streaming surface is good for that. If you're creating a, a, a file that you do want them to download, say you're putting something into a PDF instead, you can use the data download service. And we also have our job submitter service. The job submitter service is, this is say if you're creating sort of a housekeeping uh, workspace that you say want to run on a schedule, but it doesn't really have too much interaction with the user. You can just set it up with the job submitter and that's just say run the job and we won't worry about any of the inputs and outputs. And these other two ones are fairly esoteric. The network link um, has to do with you creating uh, Google Earth KML files and notifications is, is helps you with your, if you're setting up a whole automation using the automation stuff that I'm not gonna show today. So we're gonna publish this to the data streaming service. It, publishes up and it comes back with a uh, basically a little report in the log file saying where it put it. Now the neat thing it comes up with is a direct link. So now here it gives you a HTTP link to that um, workspace. So if we click on this, it's gonna fire up. But you notice what it did here is that it's asking for a login to FME server. So I'll log in. And here we see a similar page to the one I showed you before, where you can drag and drop and, and run the workspace. But the problem is that login. So we don't want to have, you don't want to necessarily want to have your company-wide users have access to your FME server uh, interface. You don't want to necessarily have them to have, to have them have a username and password just to use a service. So what we can do is under workspace actions here, we can go create a workspace app. And this is going to create the, the, the web page that uh, we, should, we saw before. And here you can get new things. You give it a name, a title. You can give it a, an extended description if you want to give, say, a help page of how people are going to use the service. Uh, again, you, you, you down, then you pick the repository and the workspace you want to uh, work with. You can change the service if you want. Expiration date, if you want something temporary, you can set expiration date. In default, it's 10 years, so it'll be a while, well, there for a while. Now, the key parts are, Require authentication. Now, sometimes you may want to require authentication, but in the, the default here is no. So this is an open app that anybody can use. And user can upload, which in this case we want, because the user is going to have to upload some files for the workspace to work. So that's, those, that's the way it's set by default, and that's probably the way you're going to use it. Now, the other cool thing here is customize. I won't go into a lot of detail here, but if you notice our web app when we ran it, it came up and says FME server at the top. Um, well, what happens if you have a corporate look and feel for your websites in your, in your, in your environment? You want your website to look like it belongs. You can, you can customize the website. You can put in icons. You can background colors, logos, banners, all sorts of things to make the, the web app look like it belongs in your web environment. So I've already created the web app, so I'm not going to do that again. 
What I will do is switch over now to a second workspace and we're just gonna do something a little different than what we did before. So this is a workspace. It's gonna build kind of like a, 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 a simple fire map, like one of those uh, little maps you see by the elevator that, that shows you, you know, where, where the stairs and stuff are. Now I don't, I didn't have all the information to work with, but I working with the, what the information we did have so again, it's it's similar to the other other workspace. We read in a Revit file, we extract uh, features, um, and then we extract the fire rating so we can color the walls a different color by the fire rating. But the key here is when we read the Revit file, before we read the surfaces, so we're reading the Revit file in 3D. Here, we're reading the Revit file as floor plans. So in this case, when you're creating a 2D map, you might want you, you might want to read the the the, the rep file as 2D, um, and in this case, we, once we we color it up, we're just going to instead of going out to a 3JS, we're going out to SVG, which is a scale of vector graphics, and it's uh, again it's another um, format that you can bury into an HTML file that shows up on your browser, but in this case, it's a it's a 2D. And then in, we're, all, we're gonna use the HTML report generator to sort of fold that into uh, a bigger web page that's got a, a title and like a little legend. Uh, and you can create all these with uh, little snippets of HTML or, or you know, settings in this uh, HTML report generator. And then the SVG just goes in as custom HTML. So, and then in, uh, again, we're, here we're using the HTML writer, similar to the, 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 the text line writer, but it is does design more to, to work with HTML output. So let's see what that looks like. Well, actually, what we'll do here is we'll publish this up to FME server, again, to Big Dog. Now here you see that we're uploading the file. So in this case, there's a, a, a template for the SVG that's gonna go with the workspace. We'll write it up, data streaming again, okay. And we're just gonna run it from here. Now I've already logged into FME server, that's not why that's why it's not asking me for username and password again. And let's grab the file, drag and drop it there, and hit run. And I got a little dead time while it's running. Now, if you have a big Revit file you may want to look at making this, this process asynchronous. Um, if, you, if the user has to wait more than about 10 seconds, they tend to get a little antsy. Whereas if you make the process asynchronous, you can set it up so that you create the file, you, then it, you send the user uh, an email link to the HTML file and then they can click on it. And generally that really ups the user's tolerance for waiting. Because if they wait for an email, they're kind of expecting uh, to wait a, a bit longer than just something popping up on the screen. So it's kind of like a little bit of human engineering. So this just shows us our, our SVG. Um, we have, the, again, the lines, the fire ratings. We have a the really you know, cheesy uh, legend here. But the, the thing about uh, the, the 2D floor plan view of uh, Revit is you see that you, you get this sort of annotated view of the symbols. So instead of the doors being a 3D door, now you get the, the 2D door swings. And anything in, in Revit that has this annotated, like say a lot of the, the symbolization will come through with, with the annotated view. Um, yeah, so that, that's, that's pretty much it for the, the, like I said, this is a very simple floor plan. And if you want, you could say, put this out to PDF instead for somebody to download. Okay. So the last thing I wanna show you is we'll go to our last workspace. And this is a little bit more complex, um, but this is the one we've, been, we've published for a while. And uh, it basically takes Revit data and moves it out to the Apple Indoor Maps IMDF file, which is a very, which has very strict topological uh, restrictions on it and uh, has some, some very uptight standards. Um, so there's a lot more work kind of has to go on um, to be done, but Revit is actually kind of ideal for going to IMDF because it is it it, it forces um, 
a, a structure on you much worse uh, or much stricter than say a CAD file uh, would. Getting CAD files into INDF can actually be a bit of a nightmare, but Revit is fairly simple. We just essentially have doors, rooms, and walls. That's all we really need. And it creates the entire IMDF data set for you, um, which looks a little something. If we throw that into the sandbox, uh, Apple sandbox, this is what we see. So that's a good clean, it's a good clean map. Just a few warnings. Um, in this case, we have a couple of floors that we can see and it's, and it's geo-referenced. And that's all taken care of by uh, this workspace. Now, the one thing I would point out for IMDF, it's very important that you have rooms everywhere. Um, you must have a complete room coverage of your entire building. Uh, if you have, the walls are fine, but really the, the key thing is rooms, not only just for the coverage, but also for the categorization of your spaces. So, the uh, advantage of, your, of the IMDF output is that once you have an IMDF file of your facility, you can upload that into Apple's survey application, survey your building, and now you have full location services on your iPhone or some iPads uh, within your building, same as you would have outside as your GPS, and it's all completely seamless. Uh, and that's a useful thing to have, uh, especially if you're doing with any sort of AR work, which uh, Dimitri will show you uh, coming up. But that was just a showcase of some of the things you can do working with the Revit data in FME and how you can make them easier to use in your firm. So back to you, dude. Does the dude have anything to add or do we want to pass on to Dimitri? Uh, maybe you can just introduce Dimitri and just say what he's about to do maybe. Yeah, so Dimitri is going to illustrate what Dave showed, which is the notion that we have uh, a fire plan um, that we've developed. What Dimitri is going to demo is the notion that you can take that idea a little bit further. We don't have the, quite the same data set, but there's a nice connection between taking a fire plan that you see by the elevator and then making an AR app that sort of allows you to look at that in augmented reality. Oh, hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, augmented reality is a trendy and cool thing, but of course it's not uh, quite mature yet, and it's still, uh, we can say, in experimental stages. Um, but uh, there is a lot of excitement around it, and Apple and Google push for this technology quite hard. We can see new uh, devices, uh, new sensors uh, in our phones, such as LiDAR, which uh, can really improve the, the whole experience. Uh, but uh, it's pretty hard, actually, to to show augmented reality to, well, if you don't experience it yourself, then it's pretty hard to show it. The maximum we can do is to make a video. So that's what I, I, I made here. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I will explain what, what I do here. So, um, but let's talk about augmented reality first. What the word reality means in this context. Uh, it means actually our world. Uh, and uh, showing uh, augmented world makes only sense in the context of real world and for a Revit file real world will be well the building that that a Revit file represents uh, and we have some difficulties with that because I've got a Revit model from Dave and I don't even know whether that building really exists uh, <clears throat> so I had to well fake uh, the building itself and for that I used our safe, safe software office so I used the real pipes from um, uh, from a Revit file but place them in, well, not really unreal, in unreal environment, our office building. So I just put some walls uh, in my uh, augmented reality file and um, uh, hid, uh, hid the, the pipes behind it. So maybe uh, now I can show you the video and I hope it will play nicely. If not, uh, we can share the link to it. But here we go. So I walk. Uh, around our office, come to this corner, and here is my wall. And I would like to see what's behind this wall. So what I do, I just turn the wall off, and I see all the pipes that came from Revit. Well, not all the pipes, I just clipped a portion of, of the huge file, uh, this, like 9,000 9, pipes, and just left this, left this small portion of it. So, And what we see here, we shouldn't. We should never forget. So uh, what we see here is what our model says, and that's why I placed some, you know, 
Halloween pumpkins here, just uh, for us not to forget that <laughs> uh, sometimes the reality may differ from what we see on our maps. Now I can put the walls back and just keep walking. I can maybe just quickly show you the workspace that does it. Well, Dimitri is firing that up. I'll just mention yeah. that FME AR is a free mobile app that we, we give away to anybody that wants it, that we've been working on. It's safe. We realized that that augmented reality is an interesting destination for data, and there wasn't any format that was obvious to us that would actually do this. So we decided to do our own. So inside of FME, there's an FME AR writer, which I think must be the destination in this workspace. Right, Dimitri? That's correct, yes. So, and uh, this workspace has uh, quite a few transformers, but, uh, well, uh, Revit is, is, is a 3D format and we don't have to do much here. So this portion is actually just simple clipping. Um, and I hope maybe next year we will be showing you something better, just a single clipper transformer. We can clip nicely solids and point clouds, but we have some difficulties clipping uh, surfaces. Uh, so that's basically what I do here. Just try to get some pipes around the, the room that I picked from Revit file. And the rest is just setting some attributes. I actually don't, don't need those transformers, uh, but I keep them because we're just adding attribute support to our FME AR app. So you would just point on an object and get some attributes uh, that uh, usually you, you would see normally in, for example, your GIS application. So, and then I just save it to an AR file. So, uh, Maybe another problem with AR uh, data is that it's pretty hard to place it correctly. Uh, currently, we are testing you know, high precision, uh, high accuracy uh, GPS device for outdoor uh, augmented reality, and it works really nice. But for indoor, we have some difficulties. Uh, and here I use, uh, with this model, I use a simple trick where I just use that corner that you saw, the corner, as my anchor. And all I have to do is just uh, match the, the model once it's loaded and shown on my screen and on my phone uh, with, with the real walls. So I match them and then I can uh, explore the scene. So uh, we will share everything what we show today, I think, uh, but certainly you, will, you can get this one and play with, with that yourself. So that, that's it from me and we can switch to uh, whoever's next. Yeah, I just thought I'd throw in a, a comment there uh, when you're mentioning about how you, you can precisely locate with the GPS outdoors, but there's an issue with the indoors. That's actually the big advantage of creating the Apple uh, indoor maps file is that um, you may or may not need a map of the interior of your building, but if you create the map and, and survey your building, you now have a location services inside your building that are as good or better as the ones outside using the GPS. Okay, so I think I'll uh, begin the end here. This is the, the beginning of the end, I guess. And so the thing we, we hope you can take away from today's brief tour at at least some of the possibilities is that there is an opportunity not to waste that great data that's inside your Revit files and uh, and we hope that you can see how you can quite easily start to do some pretty powerful things yeah and that you can see the the results that can be achieved we only show a handful today we didn't go to ArcGIS we didn't go to ArcGIS online but you can do these things and we know that ArcGIS does support native Revit reading but the advantage with FME is you get to do some transformation you can make sure that when the data lands in ArcGIS it is exactly the way you want it to be We've got a handful of resources here, and I think Elizabeth will be chatting those out right now. Um, basically, the server web apps that Dave showed, you can get an introduction to that. We've got a bit of a walkthrough on how you can get to SketchUp, if that's what you'd like to do from Revit, which also teaches you some stuff about Revit itself. And um, of course, you can look into more details about Revit to Excel, which frankly, is an extremely valuable scenario. And with a little bit of manipulation in FME, you can create that Excel spreadsheet of your dreams um, by, by doing that. So those are some things to check out afterwards for sure. Uh, in terms of how we actually sell this stuff, um, like any good software company, we give you a chance to buy subscriptions if you want. And sometimes those are kind of all you can use uh, flat rates for an organization based on its size. Other times it's kind of 
around uh, the, the, the volume that you're having and getting you uh, a, a more inexpensive way to get going that way. We, of course, will sell you a perpetual license and we'll always do that. And that's uh, a great thing too. And lastly, you can use uh, FME server stuff within the cloud and there's all kinds of options there as well. But if you wanted to try the stuff that we're showing today, once you get the email from us, that'll have all these examples and the data. And I want to thank the dude for creating us some interesting Revit uh, examples to work on. So you can, we'll be sending that all out. So you can grab yourself a, a beta, or not a beta, an actual release of FME 2021.2, which I think is out, or if it isn't, it will be very shortly. I can't remember when it got released. Um, but anyway, if it's not out yet, then you can have 2021.1, but you can grab that off of our downloads page that uh, Elizabeth has got there. Yes, it must be the dot two. I'm not paying attention for when that's um, coming, but anyway, and you can download the workspaces from this webinar and then apply it to your own Revit data and have some fun. I think you're right, right Dale. I think 2021.2 is coming out soon. Yeah, I think we're ahead of ourselves. I think this is a little bit uh, in the future because I don't remember. I know Elizabeth was laughing at me because uh, I was practicing these slides and I saw some wording on a slide. I said, wow, that's fantastic. Did you did you come up with that, Elizabeth? And she told me that I did about a month ago. So um, yeah. at least I have a good uh, a good re good uh, opinion of my work. But um, yeah, the dot one is um, what we have right now. There's no changes actually from dot one to dot two as far as the workflows we saw today. So um, that that won't make any difference. And so I think we're at the point where we're going to um, ask for audience guesses. Does anybody know who the masked Revit user was? And so if you do know, chat it in there. And I'm sure that um, I can try to scare up a prize to send to you if you were to guess. Uh, but I'm going to put the camera on here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, there there I am. And um, and for me, I guess I'm going to go with the Scooby Doo ending where I say, and I would have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for those meddling kids. There, that's the Scooby-Doo ending. Woo, it's easier to talk when you're not wearing that. But do we have guesses yet? Doesn't look like, uh, woo, I just about revealed the dude's name. <laughs> uh, any friends and family, colleagues tuned in of the dudes? Uh, let's see, looks like, uh, looks like, dude, you're gonna get the prize. Dude sometimes know who's the dudes is. Dude can't talk. <laughs> is that the dude's real hair or not? That's what the audience wants to know. The dude's real hair is actually pretty close to these these days, but uh, not exactly. This is a very <laughs> still, nice wig. My uh, my one son basically. I don't think he's had a haircut actually since the COVID started. So he's uh, he's looking like the dude. So is it ready for the reveal? Oh, there, there, yeah, there's where reality meets uh, fiction. Yeah. Well, are we ready? I think let's reveal it. Wow. I oh. never would have guessed it. The tape. <laughs> wow. Thanks so much, Greg, for joining. Oh, I didn't actually, I, I'm revealing your name, but tell us who you are. Uh, Greg Schleusner. Uh, I work for HOK. Uh, like, Dale said I sort of wanted to get the power of Revit out in front of more people. So we talked about this for a while. I'm glad we did this. And I, I would I think it would be good to keep keep pushing on this direction because there's so much to do in this area. So uh, but I'm glad I could join today. And thanks for being such a great sport and going with the uh, with the theme that we had. But but it was Greg's vision to try to get users together and show some of the scenarios that they they're doing to leverage Revit data using FME so that others can leverage that and learn from each other. And this is really our first foray into it. And we thank all of you for joining that. And if any of you would like to be, we won't make you wear a mask, but to join this kind of thing, we, we thought of uh, even getting people together using Twitch or some other types of tech. And um, there, there may be some corporate IT issues with that, but, but we can use even go to webinar like this, which is a little bit safer to explore that. But uh, really appreciate what you brought to the table, Greg, and thank you so much for the idea. And I will say while I've got the floor, Greg has been so helpful uh, to say for many, many, many years. I can't even recall when we began talking to each other um, in terms of giving us insights as to how we can push FME into areas that are making more and more value for companies like Greg. Greg, do you want to tell us a little bit about what HOK does? Yeah, so HOK is a architecture, engineering, interior design, 
uh, urban planning firm. We're, you know, 1,700 people or something like that, mostly based in the U.S., but we operate all over the world. Uh, we have interesting use cases. Our first real use case was was uh, making uh, a million buildings in InfraWorks from uh, from city engine data. Uh, but then our our day to day use cases, we do tons of data automation using it. So. Yeah, we're a longtime user for me, and we think it's pretty powerful, and the Revit stuff is pretty nice. So, yeah. I know that David from your uh, Houston office has given talks at FME World Tour before, and also I think you, Greg, have spoken at uh, FME UCs, and those talks would be available online, and we could try to fish them out actually for the follow up email because they're they're very insightful, and I, I'm always so impressed with what you and your colleagues are up to and what you've done. Yeah, and and uh, Chris Zug actually gave the talk about that city engine workflow ooh, uh, a long time ago, but that would be good to include as well. So yeah, yeah, you're probably no, there was mine. Mine are probably not so insightful, but uh... <laughs> you're too hard on yourself. Uh, but yeah, it's it's. Uh, I I know that actually some of what um, what David is up to in Houston it is actually using FME as almost like a file manipulation or file management kind of thing. And we have had people do mass migrations of lots of, for example, DWG files into BIM 360 using FME, which don't really touch on the geometry stuff that we largely were talking today, but all of that is all possible to automate. Oh. Yeah. So anyway, thanks. Thanks, Greg. And uh, we'll keep the cameras on and uh, maybe Dave can join us as we kind of wrap up here into some more Q&A. So um, Mark Ireland, do you want to join as well? Uh, I thought it would be interesting to look at a few. Um, yeah, I see David is David is online, and David actually did guess your your colleague David did guess it was you. Uh, isn't that a surprise? Yeah, surprise. Great. Dave might have known that I was doing this, so yeah, surprising. I don't know. Yes. Maybe. Maybe. You, you uh, also. I don't know. Go ahead. The the dude actually revealed his own name early on as well. Did you notice that? Yes, the dude uh, sometimes talks about himself in the third person, and that's a problem when you're trying to hide your name. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dave or Mark, um, any any questions you think we should highlight for folks before we wrap up? There was a question about um, reading files from the Autodesk Construction Cloud or BIM 360, which I believe we have a transformer that will do that. Yeah, we, we do have a BIM 360 connector to allow you to uh, upload and download files. I yeah. think you just bring down FME and type BIM 360 and it'll uh, fire it up. I I have to ask, I see Andrea from SAFE is on the call um, somewhere. She can maybe chat to us in Slack. I don't recall if BIM 360 connector works with ACC, the construction cloud, or we might have a little bit of work uh, to do there, okay. I think, to um, to do that. But anyway, Fran, Francisco, if you could let us know if the ACC is something that would matter to you, uh, please do. Greg, from your perspective, uh, do you think we should be supporting the ACC? Yeah, I think a lot of people, so there's there's the published models. This is what Forge works off of, and that would be a great target because a lot of people go through that workflow a lot to distribute information and so forth. So I think that would be a great add. Yep. Yeah, good. Another one worth highlighting is this question about um, about uh, which versions of Revit do we read? And uh, Greg would know better, but I think we can go back quite a ways, like many years in the past, up to Revit 2021. But Revit 2022 is is coming into the betas of FME 2022 by the end of the year. We have to do a library upgrade. But Greg, in your case, do you have lots of versions of Revit in the company, or and how bad is it that we don't support 2022 yet? Uh, for us, 2022 is not that big a deal. Um, I, we have uh, active versions. Most customers could have up to five or six versions. I, I know I tried a 2007 file uh, in prep for this, and that didn't work because I think the libraries you guys use maybe you start at 2011, I think. Okay. Yeah, that could be. Oh, I... Uh... I was reminded just now, I wonder if there's any Canadians on this call that grew up in the 70s and saw the Red Rose TV commercials where the people would be drinking the tea and then they would they would say, it was a British person, and they'd say, only in Canada, eh? Pity. 
because that's I'm guessing that uh, one of the British people here answered this thing about the 360 connector. Uh, Sebastian told us that it does not, our 360 connector does not work with the construction cloud. So we do have work today there. To which, Mark, was that you that said pity? I did, yes. The, do you I know the red know rose? The red, I didn't know about a red rose ad, no. Yeah, I bet um, you that Stan Johnson has seen the red rose commercials, but um, yeah. Yeah. So somebody, I, somebody has mentioned that 2022 is a big deal for, for them. So um, yeah. yeah, and it, it does see that say that we are a bit slow there. David is pointing that out because I, I think Autodesk did release in April. And so we we will um, I'll work with uh, the team on that to see if there's any way like the, the goal normally would be that that kind of thing would be in our dot two release. So. Yeah. Let's see. Dave. If we're going to go to Tririga, does the you've done some work with Tririga? Can we put CAD files up into it? Um, most of the, the work I've done with Tririga has been querying it in order to uh, tie it to like CAD data or Revit data that's been already linked to it. But the 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 API is there, and we have the tools um, that we through our HTTP caller to work with SOAP API. So. I believe we can upload the, the data there. Um, I have been playing around with uploading documents to a particular record, but I think actually uploading the um, uploading the uh, CAD files to the repository would probably be simpler. Um, but yeah, that is something we are working on. And and also, I'm guessing, Dave, if I, I don't know Tririga very well, but it it has a fairly um, imposed specification that you need to have your CAD files adhering to. Is that correct? Well, your CAD files must be uh, checked, checked into Tririga if you, if you want to share the information between them. And yeah, they have some very strict topology rules that are actually very, you know, similar to the indoor maps topology rules that your, your data must be clean. And uh, just to put in a plug here, FME, too, has the, FME has the tools that can help you uh, get your CAD data into uh, good shape for uh, integrating with Tririga. Uh, and I'll just Tririga is a lot easier because it's just naturally clean data, right? So, um, just sort of piggybacking off of Dave's uh, comment there, someone had asked about exporting from Revit into a specific CAD standard. And ironically, we began FME to go from GIS to specific CAD standards, knowing that everybody has their own CAD standards. So it's a very we built a very flexible tool for being able to set levels and colors and line styles and all these sorts of things. And that was for GIS to CAD, but there's no reason it can't be applied to Revit to CAD. We can read the floor plans, we can squish. Do you, I think we have something that takes a 3D object and squishes it down, right, Dave, into 2D? Yeah, yeah, you can use that. That is sometimes uh, uh, useful um, if you just say want simplified 2D output from your Revit, that's the surface footprint replacer. Um, Yes, but if you, if you prefer, and I think going to CAD, they would probably prefer the um, the annotative sort of look of the floor plan views that we can also extract from Revit. So, like you saw, that you give the doors with the door swings, etc. Yes, the vanities with sinks, or you know, toilets that look like toilets, sort of things. Um, yeah, so that's 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 where you want to use the floor plan view. Um, we also give you the option, of, and I didn't show it, but you can pick particular views. Uh, from Revit to to extract that floor plan stuff. So um, I'm not a huge Revit uh, user, but I know that you can set up different views in Revit to to show uh, to sort of zero on, in on the information you want to show, and we will extract those those particular views with their filters and stuff intact, and and that's the information that you could move to CAD. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I, I will just add we've actually use the DWG tools to take Revit CAD drawings into client standards because there's some stuff you can't do on the DWG side as well. So like block naming consistencies and stuff like that. So both are certainly uh, possible, but I don't think we've done a, a Revit based version of that yet. So it's something to yeah. explore. Right. Yeah. One advantage of, I think FME has over Revit's the CAD export is that when you when you go through FME, we retain all the schedule information on the the features. Uh, Revit's CAD export just gives you the geometry, as far as I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, Greg. 
but with with FME you can you can bring in all the schedule properties and you can you can propagate those as you see fit either in a companion Excel file or if you're using uh, the CAD uh, applications that support app, uh, attributes you can put those onto your your CAD data as attributes yeah so the best you'll get out of Revit without plugins would be block information you won't get any of this over object ID or object info and stuff like that so then, I think yeah go sorry. ahead Dave we'll I was go. just got another question here asking about materials and thickness of architectural entities and I just like to say that yeah when we read Revit we read all of the schedules associated with the, the features so all of that information uh, comes out in Revit so then you can filter on it or you can extract it uh what have you but all that information definitely is there i think there is some just to, uh, there's some in the beta right now there's some instance data that's uh, being exposed as in the release notes I, I read i read i read beta release notes um but there is some some instance information i think some people would be looking for that's not there yet but i think that's the kind of information you need to ask for so yeah, and there's also some, I mean, going forward, uh, uh, some people have been asking actually about uh, metadata because they're, 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 they want to validate the Revit files as to um, say you're, you're, you should have used these types of families or this sort of information. And, and we don't do that yet, but I, I believe we're working, it's one of the things we're working towards. Because metadata validation seems to be quite important to people now. I think I heard also that the next version of the library we use to read this is going to give us either more complete or there's anyway some improvements around the schedule reading we think that that are that's going to come as well. So that should yeah. be helpful. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, with with the Revit reader and with FME in general, it's always a we're always trying to improve, so it's always a moving target. So if we don't yeah. have what what you need now, check back in a, a couple of months and chances are the relentless pursuit of perfection. Yes. So uh, just just as we are going to wrap up here, I just want to ask Greg one more question. Things like Navisworks, things like IFC, IFC five. How important are those things to your workflows, and um, and and how would you advise us? And also, if any customers are on that that have opinions, please chat them in too. Well, the, on the Navisworks side, one of the interesting things that's um, that we've been exploring is the concept of the coordination model within Revit, and this is in the Revit context. So there's a lot of construction uh, CMs and GCs that use Navisworks for coordination. But one of the nice interesting things you can do is you can write that uh, into Navisworks or NWC format and basically see that in the Revit context as a, as a, a frame buffer, basically. Uh, so it's an interesting idea that you could do the demo we just showed of doing change detection and show a Navisworks file streamed into the Revit context and, oh, this is what the architect changed this week. Perfect example of the Navisworks workflow that would be, that's specifically valuable for us, but I'm sure uh, a lot of other mm. people moving from GIS to Navisworks would be interesting as well. Um, and then the IFC side, I think IFC 5 is a, a ways away, but um, I think, you know, we don't talk, touch infrastructure, but the fact that it's in the 4.3 release that's a candidate right now, yeah, I think that's going to be a pretty pretty important. And then, um, yeah, we've talked about Revit to IFC, which I think um, mm -hmm. uh, is possible right now, but Dave is definitely right. You can make some pretty massive files um, going that route, but I think that's, you've talked about improving that in the future as well. Yes. Okay, well, I think uh, we're we're past the hour, so I think it might be time to wrap up. I want to thank Dave for all the work behind the scenes, Dimitri for joining in today to show us some other ways, some new modern fancy ways of leveraging Revit data. Elizabeth for all the work in the back setting this all up. Stephanie, who came up with the title for this long ago. And Greg, I especially want to thank you for suggesting this and for putting in all the work to make this happen, getting us some great demo files. Uh, thanks for being such a great sport. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, thanks to all your hard work on your, the safe side of things. So appreciate it. Yeah. I also forgot to thank our questions and answer crew. I think we had Andrea and, of course, Mark Ireland and maybe even Mark Stokes in the back. I don't exactly know. But anyway, one or more Marks, but especially Mark Ireland, thanks so much for fielding a lot of the questions today. And I think with that, Elizabeth, I'll hand it back to you. 
Awesome. I'll just echo uh, Mark's remark in the chat there. If you do have any questions that come up about SAFE in general or anything Revit specific, definitely visit us on the community and type your question into our technical forums there. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us today.